All right, now if you'll take your Bibles and join me. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, we begin looking at this passage last week. Jesus claiming to be the light of the world. I want to read the entire passage again, beginning in verse 12 and reading through verse 30. John 8 and verse 12 says, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true for I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it. But I and the Father who sent me, even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your Father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Then he said again to them, I go away, and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they were saying to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me, and he has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. As, as we begin looking at this last week, I told you he, he's made the claim he's here at the festival. He's claimed to be the water of life and now the light of life. He, he's in the crowded place. Verse, verse 19 there said, told, uh, not verse 19, but verse 20 told us that he was in the treasury. Uh, that's an extremely crowded pl place. So he's got a lot of people together and he's making these claims. I, and especially this one, I am the light of the world. This is a very clear claim to be God. Have you ever encountered somebody when you were witnessing and they were just extremely hard? They, they were extremely resistant to the message. Cold, even, um, demonstrated no kind of of concern, care, reverence, anything for God, anything for the church. Um, have you ever left that encounter and wondered, I wonder if anything will ever change? That could have been it, right? 
Have you ever had an opportunity to make a choice and made the wrong one? And then you've looked back and thought, right here's where it went wrong. Right here, th this is what led me to make this decision. This is what led me to do this. And this is where I went astray. And, and there's some regret there, isn't there? there, there there's a, some remorse. And, and sometimes maybe even there's an opportunity to go back, and correct what you had done wrong, and, and make things right. The people Jesus is talking to here, that opportunity slips by. For three years, he has been going through Israel and Judah. He's been proclaiming the gospel. He's been calling people to faith in him. He has been doing works that only God can do. He's fed thousands with just a few fish and a few loaves of bread. He created on the spot more food for everybody who was there. And in fact, more food than was needed for everybody there. He's basically ended sickness in Israel. He has healed, uh, raised the dead. The evidence for who he is is clear. It is extremely obvious. And look, anytime anything happens that's good, news spreads. You do not need Facebook. You don't need Twitter. You don't need Instagram for something like that to begin to spread. When something happens, people begin to talk about it. This would have been news all over this region. There's nobody practically that would not have, by this point in time, have heard about what this Jesus from Nazareth is doing and saying. Here he is at the festival with the Jews. And I'm not using Jews as in the same sense that they do here. Here it's mainly the leaders when they're talking about the Jews, but the Jewish people, people familiar with the Old Testament, people familiar with the prophecies pointing to the coming Messiah. People who should have been able to look at those prophecies, look at this man Jesus, put the two together and say, that's the Messiah. He is getting very close. We are, as we're studying the life of Christ here, we are getting very close. He is getting very close to the end of his life. He's getting close to his crucifixion, his death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension. And he's still calling people to repentance and faith. He's still calling people's attention to the fact that he is, in fact, the Messiah. I want you to think about this before we start digging into the text. The people he's calling, the people he's telling in, in this festival, the people he's standing before and saying, I am the light of the world, have rejected him for three years, and he hasn't stopped calling them. When can we give up? When can we say, well, it's hopeless. There's no use sharing with them anymore. He's still calling. His, his call to them is a little more stern. He called, he, he's, he, he said he was the light of the world, and there's this entire uh, back and forth between him and the Jews. They're saying your testimony is not worthy. You're talking about yourself. And, 
And uh, there's even that mocking there at the end of the passage we looked at last week when he was talking about the father testifying on his behalf and their question, where is your father? Uh, sort of a, a jab at, we understand you're illegitimate. We, we know the story about your mom and your dad. Where, where is this father? And, and not only that, but it's sort of a thing at him we know your father and he's from here he's from earth we know this human man in the passage we're looking at tonight Jesus begins to expose their heart he begins to expose the things in their heart in their life that keep them in unbelief, that keep them from, it, from recognizing him as the Messiah. He says in verse 21, then he said again to them, he, he said that earlier in chapter 7 when, when he claimed to be the water of life, he said, I go away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin." Where I'm going, you cannot come. That's a very chilling statement. He's telling them, I'm going away. And when he says, I'm going away, he is talking about his soon to come death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. When he ascends uh, after his resurrection, he ascends to the Father, and the Father is in heaven right he is at the right hand of the father and he is telling them you cannot come where I am going you cannot come now again this this society is built on this religion is built on a works based salvation you do in order to gain salvation Again, I want to point out that word cannot. He does not say you may not come. He's flat out telling them you don't have the ability to do this. You can't get there. It's impossible for you. But he's also telling them when he, when he says you will die in your sin and where I'm going you cannot come. He's telling them I'm going to heaven and you're not. I will be in heaven, and you will not be there. I will be with the Father, and you will not. Look at their response. Their response exposes their attitude of their own righteousness. They are self-righteous individuals. They know how good they are. They know how deserving they are. They know all that they have done to please God. And so they respond by saying, Surely he will not kill himself. Will he? Since he says where I'm going, you're not, you cannot come. For the Jews... An individual that takes his own life, and even the writings of Josephus reflect this, uh, the, the Jews believed that the darkest places in hell were reserved for those who took their own life. Their understanding of him going somewhere they could not go, there's only one place he could possibly go that they can't. They, they spoke earlier, is he going to go to the dispersion and, and, and preach to the Gentiles? Well, we can go there, right? We've got two legs and we can walk anywhere we want to go. We can go anywhere you want to go. Their thought is there's only one place you can go we can't, and that's the hell. That's why they say he's not going to kill himself, is he? Because there's the only way he can go somewhere we can't. 
We're not going to hell. We're righteous. We're holy. We have done the works. Is he going to kill himself? This is exposing, again, as I said, their self-righteousness. They don't need a Messiah. They don't need Christ. One of the great things about our Savior, one of the, one of the things we learn from him is he never gets distracted. <laughs> he, he never chases after things like this. He doesn't even respond to that. He just moves on to the next thing that exposes the darkness and the wickedness of their own hearts. He says in verse 23, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Not only is he saying you are not going to heaven, but he's basically saying you're worldly. You are from, and the, the idea is you love this world. He's not talking about the beauty of this world. Look, that's one of the things I enjoy doing. I enjoy driving around. I enjoy going to the coast and the mountains and, and all these places and seeing the creation that God has created. I loved sitting in the evening with Pam and watching a sunset and seeing the glory of that. He's not talking about enjoying that. He's talking about the system of this world, the, the, the sins of the flesh, the sins of the, of the desires of men. The love for the worldly system is what he's talking about. He's saying, that's where you're from. You're, you're born into that. And he said, look, I'm not from this. I, I am from above. You are the world. I am not of this world. We know the scripture teaches us anyone of this world, anyone who loves this world does not love the Father, does not love the Son. Anyone who holds this world cannot have the Son. He's exposing their attitude here, and he's also pointing, as he works his way through this, he is pointing out, look, you're staying there. By your own accord, I have called you to salvation, and you're choosing this world over me. So he completes it. Verse 24, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. One of the things you'll see about our Savior, especially as he interacts with the religious people who just simply refuse time after time to, to embrace the evidence, to accept what is said, to embrace prophecy as they continue to come up with excuse after excuse after excuse. Our Savior never makes it easier for them. It's almost as if he makes it harder in verse 24, he says, therefore, I said to you, you will die in your sins. If you remain in this world, you will die in your sins. If you do not repent of your sins and, and turn to me, you will die in your sins if you remain in this world. Now, does anyone have the King James? Verse 24, does it say, if you believe? Is the word if there, I believe? Hmm. We'll get back to that in a second. But he says, for unless you believe, the New Americans say, unless you believe that I am, the word he's not there. You recognize that? For unless you believe that I am. Anyone else say that? I am? When Moses asked God, when I go to your people and tell them that your God has sent me, who should I say sent me? And he said, I am. Well, the word he is not there in the Greek. Jesus says, for unless you believe that I am, 
They've already, they've already got a problem with that. <laughs> they've already got a problem with the fact that he claims to be God in here, in their face. He's saying, unless you believe that I am God, you're not coming. You are not. You will die in your sins. But go back to the King James. That word, if. That's a conditional word. And it's a beautiful word because he is crying out to them saying, if you'll just repent. If you'll just repent. Hope is still available. The Savior is still there to save sinners, hard-hearted sinners. And he's just simply saying, if you'll just repent, if you'll come to me, you can be saved. But if you don't, you will die in your sins. Verse 25. So they were saying to him, who are you? Who are you? Now, this could be taken two ways. One, it could be them looking at him saying, who are you to judge us? Us. We are the religious elite. We are the religious rulers. Who in the world are you to pronounce judgment on us? Or it could be them simply saying, who are you? You're, you're nobody. Who, who do you think you are? Notice his response. Because his response exposes another problem that they have. What have I been to saying to you from the beginning? Jesus never changed his message. He came preaching that he was the Messiah. He came calling men to repentance and faith, to trust in him. The problem all along has been their rejection of truth. Unwilling to learn. That is a dangerous mentality for us to have. Regardless of our age, regardless of our education, regardless of how long we've studied the Word of God, one of the things we should be is open to learning. These men have learned all they want to, and they're not willing to learn anything. Jesus says, what have I been telling you from the beginning? The message has been the same. I've been telling you over and over and over, and you simply reject truth. He continues, he says, I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true in the things which I heard from him. These I speak to the world. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. They continue to reject anything that he has claimed. They continue to learn, that continue, continue to refuse to learn. Folks, again, I want to point out that they had the Old Testament, familiar with the prophecies. At the time of his birth, there was a heightened messianic expectation. They were looking for a coming Messiah. He came and they missed it. He fulfilled the prophecies and they missed it. The, very, very soon after this, the triumphant entry, he has all but given them a date in the Old Testament. When he spoke through Nehemiah, when he spoke through Ezra, he, he gave them almost an exact date of when the Messiah would show up, when to be looking for it. And guess what they do? They miss it. Because they had formed their own religion in their minds and they were unwilling to learn anything else. He's come, he's, he's talked about himself, he's talked about the Father, and they simply, simply reject it.
He continues in verse 28 and says, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. He who has sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Now there's some... He is pointing to them about his coming crucifixion, when you lift up the Son of Man. When he says, then you will know, it should really be, you should know. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. You're going to see it with your own eyes. You are going to do it with your own hands. You should see. Notice it again, that I am. He's not there. You will know. You should know. I am. And again, he he goes back to the fact that my father sent me. This, This is my father's will. I am here to do my father's will. I have always been here to do my father's will. And again, this is just a constant claim. My father, my father, same nature, same essence. I am God. I am the father. I am the father. I'm one. They understand this. Unlike so many modern cults today that say Jesus never claimed to be God, over and over and over in this passage, the Jews in front of him clearly understand this man thinks he's God. Not only does this man think he's God, this man is trying to tell us he's God. That's what angers them that infuriates them. But, verse 30, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Don't let John mislead you there. Because as we get on into this, their belief is conditional and temporary. They're not full believers. They're not true believers. But there are some that are at least hearing what he's saying, and they're at least willing to put together the things that he says, the things that he's done, and have a partial belief in him. I I want to... say two things before we close tonight. First and foremost, if there is any of you here tonight, whether you're here in person, whether you're on live stream, you have never, for whatever reason, you've rejected salvation in Christ and Christ alone. You have never repented of your sins and come to him. He makes it very clear over and over, unless you do that, Unless you do that, unless you believe that he is God, unless you believe that he is the Messiah sent by the Father as the sacrificial atoning uh, lamb for your sins, you will die in your sins. You die in your sins, that is a choice, that is a decision you can never go back and remake. You can't fix that one. When the last breath is taken, that decision is final. There is not a time after death in which Jesus says, you got one more chance. And you know, and I know life well enough to know this. There is nothing that guarantees any of us will make it out that back door tonight. This could be it. This could be it. This is something you need to go to him now. Believers, don't give up on testimony. Don't give up on witnessing. 
Christ is in the business of saving. Our job is simply to present the truth. How long until he calls us home? We present the gospel. We preach the gospel. We hammer the truth. That We're like a one drum beating individual. That's the one thing we've got. Just keep preaching the truth and let Christ work in their hearts. Our, our Savior came to save. Sometimes we must be like him, though. We must kind of give a stern warning. Hard-hearted people are hard to reach. The longer hard-hearted people reject, the harder their hearts get. That doesn't make them unsavable, <laughs> right? Our Savior can crack any heart. So if you're, if you're a believer here tonight, don't give up. If you're an unbeliever, repent. Repent and turn to Christ. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Lord, as we close our time together tonight, Lord, it is a difficult, difficult um, truth to swallow at times, even for believers. Father, time after time, Christ warned, you will die in your sins. Father, sometimes we just don't take it serious enough. Whether we be believers or unbelievers, we just don't take it serious enough. Grant us repentance for that, Father. Help us to be compassionate and passionate about preaching the gospel to the lost people we know. Father, we pray for those that are in our church, in our families, in our neighborhoods. Lord, that you would use us to proclaim the gospel and you would, the Holy Spirit would, Father God, give them life. Bring them to repentance and faith so that we can rejoice in your work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.